Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the fourth and last in the current round of our webinars profiling some of the research work that we're doing within the Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellowship Programme at CISL. Really, really pleased you could join us, and I'm sure this is going to be um, a very exciting uh, topic from two uh, very exciting people here at CISL, Anna Barford and uh, Marina Zarilla. The, um, the topic is, 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 is super interesting. It's on living wages in complex value chains and how companies are adopting them. And I'll say just a tiny bit of introduction about that in a second. Um, what I wanted to say first of all is that um, the, uh, the, the actual program from where this work uh, comes out of is called the Global Sustainability Fellowship Program, the Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellowship Program. And that is supported by a range of different companies and, uh, and, uh, and foundations to enable us to conduct research work, which is very focused on problem solving within the business and policy community. So it has strong ap academic foundations, but it is also very deliberately targeting impact in the real world. And I think hopefully this presentation from Anna and Marina will, will, will illustrate that. This particular research is supported very generously by Unilever. Um, some of the previous uh, presentations we've had in this series have been from other companies like uh, AstraZeneca, from Sainsbury's and, and others. This one's supported by Unilever. It's independent research, however, which draws on the best, uh, the, the best approach which the university and universities generally have adopted in really getting to grips with uh, you know, global evidence and, uh, and thinking behind the topic area. So hopefully this will be of interest to you. Now I did notice, um, I'm Jake Reynolds, by the way, from, uh, from CRSL. I'm, I'm responsible for our research program here at the Institute. I did notice looking at the participation, we have banks, investors, insurance companies, retailers, manufacturers, foundations, academic organizations. So it's a, it's a, it's a usefully diverse group and has been in each of these uh, webinars, which we are providing. And I think, in some ways, diversity is particularly well suited to this topic of living wage because every organization has to be thinking about this. This is an issue for all organizations. In fact, not only private sector, but public sector too. And indeed, not only the organizations directly, but their client bases. Who are they working with? Who are they working for? And also their supply chains. And in fact, their stakeholder communities generally. So. I'm hoping very much that the uh, topic, uh, when Anna and Marina present it, will elicit thinking in your own minds about how this whole area of living wages might be applied in your own context or in your own industries or uh, communities, and that you will wish to pose questions to them for uh, probably the half an hour that we'll have after their presentation. And if you please could enter those questions that you have into the um, into the GoToMeeting uh, question space, that would be fantastic. We will then extract them and I can play them back to uh, my colleagues here um, after their presentation. So just in terms of how we, um, what we're going to cover today and um, uh, it, exactly um, the, the topic area, fair wages have been on the agenda for an awfully long time. They are, um, it, it's surprising in some ways that we have, you know, over a century, but it's surprising that despite the international commitments uh, from everywhere from the UN downwards, we still have millions of people living on what you might describe as poverty wages. And this has costs for, obviously, for the workers themselves, the families, and uh, the businesses that they work for too. It's always been a concern, but in the wake of the COVID pandemic and many other social movements, which have been uh, you know, very vocal and very important over the last few years, social issues have really surged up the corporate agenda and living wage is among them. And it's receiving considerable attention at the current time. And some companies, as we know, including Unilever, have made bold commitments to, uh, to apply them right the way through their 
supply networks to attempt to end work poverty. So Anna and Marina will walk us through what living wages are, why they're needed. They'll provide a couple of case studies and an honest assessment, I think, of some of the issues that com companies are currently facing as they seek to apply them. Anna is a Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellow and her research into the potential for decent work in the circular economy has led her to focus on living wages as a key metric of, uh, of decent work. And this complements her wider interests in addressing a deficit in jobs in lower income countries and how young people can get by when the labor market demand for them is weak. On the other hand, Marina is a research assistant here at CISL. She's focused on living wages across global supply chains, and she has a, an MPhil in development studies from the University of Cambridge and experience of working in corporate social responsibility and development consulting. And her academic interests lie at, if you like, the intersection of economic development, climate change and inequalities. So um, having just explained a tiny bit about the, the fellowship program itself, introduced uh, the topic area and the two people who are going to present it. I'd like to hand over to, I think Anna, probably you'll kick off now. Um, we will come back to um, audience questions afterwards. So if I could just reiterate, do put your questions into the system and I will attempt my best to, uh, to moderate them after the presentation. So over to you, Anna. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Jake, and welcome everyone to our webinar. It's um, great that you're able to make time today to join us. So Marina has been working with me um, since last summer, and we've really been trying to understand um, this new wave of commitments to paying living wage. Is, um, so until, until a few years ago, quite a lot of living wage commitments were really focused directly on the organization and its direct employees and then to some extent they um, the people they were contracting to do work um, but then kind of in the past few years there's been this kind of new wave of commitments which are really looking at living wages but actually kind of throughout supply chains or throughout value chains which is a very exciting departure as, as Jake said because of the potential it brings to influence um, norms around pay um, and the actual practice of pay um, and to shift us from what to date has been an overwhelming kind of rhetoric of you know how much could we get for how much for how little money from workers to a way of thinking about pay in terms of how do we address make sure that the workers are paid enough to address their needs um, and to pay for the basics in life as well as have some something spare for a for if there's a crisis or an emergency as well. So it's really a kind of a shift in what, what businesses and other organizations are looking for in terms of what they pay and why they're thinking about paying more than they might have previously um, been aiming to. We're speaking to you from the University of Cambridge, as you know, um, and I'm really pleased to say, you know, this, is, this isn't a movement which is limited to corporations. So the university started paying the real living wage in 2014. Um, but then in 2018, they actually um, pushed it up above the, kind of the UK real living wage to a higher level of £10 an hour, which um, is the Cambridge living wage, which was a kind of more locally defined living wage. And the reason they did this is because, um, as some of you may know, the cost of living in Cambridge is higher than the UK average. So then using a UK level living wage doesn't necessarily give people enough to live um, in the Cambridge context. And this is why we're talking about living wages in plural, because the cost of living varies so much place to place. Um, and this is one of the complications as well, that when you start thinking about how you're going to pay your workers through supply chains, you have to work out the different costs of living in different parts of the world very often, especially when those supply chains are, are very extended. You might be wondering, like, why, why is this an issue? Why have we not solved it already? As Jake said, you know, we've had um, more than 100 years of people demanding fair pay for the work that people have done. Um, and, you know, to some extent that has been addressed. Um, statutory minimum wages are already kind of playing a really important role in um, bringing up the minimum wage, um, but it's not, to date, it's not been enough. Um, so that's where the kind of, the need for voluntary commitments has come in um, from 
um, from, from corporations in particular, which we're speaking about today. And like we know low pay is an issue. Here's some examples of some news headlines um, which point to some of the issues that we see um, surrounding low pay. So, for instance, low pay driving poverty and inequality. Low pay meaning that um, there's a risk that your workers all leave en masse because they're not actually able to afford to live based on the pay that they're receiving. Or the risk that workers do stay, but they struggle to make ends meet and they really struggle to get by and make a decent life for themselves because they're not paid enough. And it's, it's a day-to-day -day struggle, a day-to-day -day stress that they're facing as a result of the low level of pay they're receiving. There's also the issue that um, some companies have pledged to increase pay, but it's not always happened. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's, it could be for man, many different reasons, but one of the reasons is it can be hard to make sure that money gets to the people that it's intended to go to. So there's lots of kind of different issues that um, people are facing, um, but overall we can see that it's a recurring issue um, and something that does need to be addressed. Next slide, thank you. Um, so, so just to think a bit more broadly about kind of what, what's the issue globally when we're looking at pay. Currently, um, 630 million people are in working poverty. So just to be really clear, this is people who are working, they're active in the labour market, which, you know, some rhetoric kind of says, you know, should, you should work and then that will solve the problem. But people who are already working, but the level of income they're getting from that work isn't enough to lift them out of poverty. And for this particular statistic, the, the definition is the, um, the line of moderate poverty, so $3.2 a day PPP, so purchasing power parity. Just to be really clear, this isn't just an issue um, of lower or middle income countries. This is very much a global issue. So um, one example um, of that is that European workers uh, are also at relatively high risk from working poverty. Um, so one in 10 European workers um, is at risk from that. And we can see that if we, look, if we compare these numbers, we compare the 630 million people in working poverty um, with the people who are on or below the minimum wage, which is 327 million, we see that actually there's roughly about 300 million people who are earning above the minimum wage, but not enough to lift them out of working poverty. So that's a huge gap um, that we're seeing. Um, and it, again, it kind of reiterates the point that the, the minimum wages on their own aren't enough at present. Um, and just to, to give a bit more information about this, um, this graph actually shows the percentage of employees who are currently covered by minimum wages. And we can see that in some parts of the world, particularly the Arab states and Africa, the percentage of people covered by minimum wages is really, really low, under, under 30%. Um, but in no continent, 100% of employees covered by minimum wages. So there's kind of two two big issues around this. Um, one is um, minimum wages don't always um, exist or they don't necessarily apply to particular groups of workers, like particularly informal workers, for instance. Another issue is that they're, um, they're set lower than living wages. So they don't, they're not at the right level. And then the third issue would be compliance as well. So even if you're covered and the minimum wages at a good level, if employers aren't complying, then that also means people fall through the gaps. So at this stage, we just wanted to share um, a definition of what we really mean by living wages. Um, in some senses, it's implicit, um, you know, earning enough to live on. Um, Living wages have been talked about for a really long time. So the first written record of this is actually from 1894 when the factory, textile factory owner, um, Mark Oldroyd from Dewsbury in West Yorkshire, talked about living wages and the, the benefits and the need for living wages. Um, and you'll notice that um, on this slide, it kind of really flags, minimum wages offer um, something to the employee, but they also offer something to the employer. So they talk about living wages, maintaining the worker in the highest state of industrial efficiency. So there's clearly some business benefits in there that, you know, keeping, keeping people well paid is, um, is beneficial to the employer. But um, obviously the main point is it's also beneficial to the employee. Um, 
a more recent definition of which there are many, but here's a more recent definition, um, which picks up on similar themes um, in a broad sense, but um, is that the re remuneration for a standard working week should be enough to really provide a worker and their family. Um, so it's not just individual level, it's kind of family level with like, the absolute, like the, the essentials for a decent life, which obviously includes food, water, housing, education, healthcare, transport, clothing, and other essentials. Um, it also includes providing enough to deal with unexpected events. So there's some some sa potential for saving. So there's a financial buffer. And we know that um, people are more exposed to shocks and stresses if they don't have that financial buffer available to them. So it's really, really important. So now we just want to um, actually do a quick poll um, just for fun to um, offer a, a way that we can directly engage with you, um, considering we can't see see anyone on this call. Um, so Becca's going to set that up. Um, but the poll is to do with um, what's the real living wage in the UK? And there's quite a few um, different definitions of living wage. Is the, um, the water's been muddied somewhat because the government brought out its own living wage, which is actually the same as the minimum wage. Um, so they kind of borrowed that language of living wages and applied it to their minimum wage. But the government's own version is lower than the Living Wage Foundation's um, living wage, which is carefully calculated every year using a basket of different goods to work out how much it costs to live in the UK and then kind of and then applying that to a, an average sized family and making some assumptions to work out how much people would need to earn as an hourly rate based on the assumption of what they'd need at the end of a working week. So you've got about 30 seconds to answer this question just to keep the pace going um, and the question is what is the hourly real living wage in the UK? So that's not the government one that's the Living Wage Foundation's one. So please um, quickly choose what you've what you think would it would be, um, and then Becca can send in the results. Okay, I think that should be about 30 seconds now. Becca, do we have some um, some answers? I think we'll find the, the results in just a moment. Um, but I'm, I'll get started anyway, um, and we'll see we'll see um, how, how well we know the details. I appreciate that not everyone will be dialing in from the UK either. So particularly difficult question if you're if you're not based here. Um, but of the different answers we gave. Um, they, they are all actually um, set levels of wages within the UK. So here we go. So no one thought £4.30. Thank you, Becca. Um, for £4.30. £4.30 is actually one of the wage rates available to us. Um, that's what an apprentice would be paid in the UK at present. Um, no one chose um, £6.56. Um, this is the minimum wage in the UK if you're aged 18 to 20 at present. We've had um, some people choosing £8.91. So this is the UK government's, um, what they call the, the living wage. Um, that's for people aged 23 and over. Um, the correct answer was £9.90 for the UK real living wage. Um, that's how much, that's the absolute minimum. So that's the, the floor, not the ceiling um, of earnings that they, they recommend um, UK wide. Um, and most people said that, so well done everyone. Um, and then the the top one, 11 pounds 5p, is actually the hourly rate for the London living wage. And the Living Wage Foundation calculates the London living wage because as I'm sure everyone, even people not based in the UK know, um, the, the cost of living in London is um, is exceptionally high. Um, and so it's, um, there's a kind of an extra, there's an, a London waiting, which you see with many, many jobs as well, um, that there's a London waiting so people earn a bit more so they can afford the cost of living there. Um, so yeah, perhaps we can um, move back to our, our PowerPoint now. Um, but I think that the interesting thing here is that, um, that the living wage, the real living wage, isn't differentiated by age. 
Um, whereas these other ones, the minimum wage for 18 to 20 year olds and then 20, 21 and 22 year olds and then 23 plus is differentiated by age. So there's this assumption that you need less money if you're younger, which may or may not be true depending on your relationship with your parents and whether you've moved out of, from home or not. Um, Becca, is it possible to go back to the um, PowerPoint, please? Thank you. So, um, so then moving on with the presentation, um, just to say a bit more about the need for, um, for living wages. The Living Wage Foundation um, did a survey of UK workers this year and they found that actually um, low pay really has a strongly detrimental effect on people's overall quality of life. So 42% of workers said it impacted their quality of life negatively. 23% um, found that they'd fallen behind with rental mortgages due to their low pay. 28% have trouble affording to heat their homes. So we can see like low pay is associated with people not being able to meet these basic needs. Um, which we talked about. But there's also an impact on businesses. So um, the impact, of, uh, the business impact of low wages includes details like if people are on low wages, um, they might have poorer health because maybe they're going without as much food or they're living in colder homes or they're not um, able to afford the health care that they want to access. Um, people can feel less motivated because they um, they feel less valued um, by their employer, and this can lead to a loss of workers um, from sometimes. That applies to direct employees, but it can also apply um, throughout value chains because if um, people work in value chains are also um, exposed to those same stresses and strains, um, they can also experience poor health and poor well-being. It can also um, lead to higher costs of managing labour issues because if there's um, very often labour issues and labour disputes um, concern pay to some extent um, and and it's often a major major issue kind of within those conversations so if you um, deal with that by just paying people properly and paying them what they need that can also um, reduce that particular cost for businesses there's um, Another risk that businesses face from not paying um, people a decent level of income is um, that there might be social controversies that, um, that stem from that, which can result in ultimately reputational damage, um, which can have impacts on investment and also on what consumers um, want to do um, regarding your business. And there's a wider point that um, high levels of poverty and high levels of inequality can lead to kind of uh, a detrimental environment for business um, where there can be higher levels of social and economic unrest. Next slide please. So I, I think now I'll hand over to Marina who's going to um, give us some more detailed um, information about the corporate commitments um, to living wages. So thank you Marina. Perfect. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, yeah, so we now wanted to talk a little bit more to you about these corporate commitments that we've been researching for the past few months. And um, of course, as Anna said earlier, they are clearly motivated by those um, effects that low pay um, has on business, but of course, also on the workers. Um, so here on this slide, you can see just some, not all, of the corporate commitments made to living wages, both in supply chains and um, just in direct operations. Um, and the sort of timelines of these um, commitments may vary. So, for example, uh, we have here Unilever and L'Oreal, which have committed to living wages by 2030. Um, as well, we have Tesco, which um, have started paying living wages to their banana suppliers from January 2022. So they have not yet committed to all supply chains, but just certain ones which they can act upon um, at the moment. And all of these different um, companies, they are all on sort of different um, journeys towards living wages. And this is something that we found very often discussed in our in our interviews with companies. Um, they were often saying that, of course, uh, living wages are not something that can be implemented overnight, and it really is something that takes time. So just for example, um, Patagonia in, in 2019, they had 35% of their um, apparel assembly factories paying workers um, a living wage on average. 
and looking at the companies that have not yet um, completely committed to living wages in their entire supply chains. Um, we have, for example, Heineken, um, which are committing to paying fair wages to their direct employees by 2023, as well as their third party employees on site by 2030. Um, and of course, them and Natura and Co, as well as other um, multinationals are working towards implementing um, living wages in their supply chains once they take care of sort of their own operations first, um, which can be done a bit more quickly. But um, on this note, we also wanted to kind of focus in on one of the companies that we spoke to during our research and we found their journey very interesting. Um, and this is Fairphone, which is a Dutch social enterprise building a market for ethical phones. And some of you may already own um, their phones if you are very much interested in sort of ethical products. Um, but what they did is they decided to pay a living wage bonus to all of the workers um, at their the factory producing their phones in China. Um, and how they started doing this is by uh, first reviewing the living wage estimates from the Global Living Wage Coalition and the Asia Floor um, wage. So that provided them with one estimate of what's the, or a couple estimates of what the living wage should be. But in addition to that, what they did and what is really important that they did is they consulted workers um, through a survey and dialogue to find out what they really needed in order to um, have a decent standard of living. Um, so after all of this, they, they calculated how much they would need to pay in order to achieve this wage um, on their production line. And they determined that actually was only a fixed bonus of 1.50 euro per phone that would be able to close the living wage gap between the um, calculated living wage and the Chinese minimum wage. Um, and then they incorporated this into the product price and this led to um, an increase of 0.33% per phone. However, the challenge that, of course, they encountered is that Fairphone is only one company, um, only one buyer among many from that same factory. Um, and so this meant that actually the impact of their living wage contribution is blunted unless other buyers also factor in um, living wage contributions. And in order to kind of solve this issue, what they decided to do was um, first consult the workers on what they thought should be done and how um, to best distribute the bonus. Um, and through this consultation, they found that the workers agreed that it was best to actually share the living wage bonus, which was meant um, initially just for fair phone um, workers, but they wanted to actually share that among all of the workers in the factory. Um, and there are certain benefits to this. They, they say that this better accommodates for any changes in the workforce um, or the production line. And we were told um, in our interviews as well that it helps to avoid any sort of unwanted conflict or competition or favoritism within the factory. So what happens now is that um, Fairphone and, and other uh, workers at the factory, they receive this bonus uh, on top of their salary each month. And then each year, the size of the bonus is reevaluated in order to um, integrate new information and any changes in living costs year to year. Um, so that was a really interesting kind of perspective that we found just from one of the companies that we spoke to. But also through speaking to corporates, um, we were actually told that the financial sector actually plays a really important role in, um, in kind of advancing or encouraging um, corporates to commit to living wages. And so then we also conducted a number of interviews with um, members of the financial community. So we spoke to asset managers, asset owners, um, and we did find, in fact, that they are a really important stakeholder in all of this, who have a lot of potential for um, to drive positive change. So just by thinking a bit about sort of what responsible investment can do um, with regard to living wages, um, firstly, investors can consider living wages when building their portfolios. So they can incorporate living wages into their um, into their investment decisions, um, either through integrating living wages in their investment analysis and decisions, um, or through screening um, in order to include or exclude certain companies based on either their living wage policies or their wage levels. Um, as well, they can 
possibly choose to invest in, in companies that um, aim to create meaningful jobs um, in emerging economies and not only, uh, as well as providing living wages throughout their supply chains. But most often what we found by speaking to asset managers is that the way that they choose to kind of um, do something about living wages is that they um, try to improve decent work and living wage practices, outcomes and disclosure through their stewardship. So most often they will um, engage with their investee companies and try to find ways in which they can improve these practices. Um, and in addition, they can also submit or vote on um, shareholder resolutions in order to influence outcomes. Um, and we see a lot more of this being done recently. So, for example, um, you can see here in the slides in this past month, um, actually in March, um, the IDH, which is the Sustainable Trade Initiative, um, which started in the Netherlands, and it brings together over 600 companies and governments to drive um, new sustainable production and trade models. Um, they hosted a webinar and what happened is that um, as part of this, a group of 45 investors from around the globe with 6.3 trillion euro of um, assets under management, they actually issued an endorsement of IDH's living income and living wage roadmaps. Um, so they issued a statement coordinated by Sustainalytics and their endorsement actually calls on companies to develop a roadmap on living income and living wages. So you can see all of these investors here and others, um, because these are not all the 45 ones, but um, all of these investors are in support of uh, companies being a lot more involved um, and committing to, to living wages and living income, which is really positive change. Um, in addition, there are other important actors in this space. So we have ShareAction, um, which is a responsible investment charity here in the UK, also acting a bit in Europe. Um, and they work on, on several good work themes, which include living wages. Um, specifically also uh, this Monday, actually, they filed a special resolution for consideration at the AGM of a large UK supermarket retailer um, regarding living wage accreditation. Um, and they coordinated an investor coalition managing 2.2 trillion pounds for this, um, which was really notable because it was actually the first shareholder resolution calling for a listed firm to become a living wage accredited employer. And um, this is specifically important for supermarkets because no supermarkets in the UK have yet been accredited as living wage employers. So hopefully um, this should lead to some, to some positive change. Um, and clearly investors are in support of these, uh, of these resolutions. Um, Chair Action also have a good work coalition, which brings together a number of investors that want to uh, improve decent work practices. And they have the Workforce Disclosure Initiative, which um, basically encourages companies to um, better disclose on workforce related uh, matters, including, including wages and living wages. Um, lastly, here on the slide, we have the platform Living Wage Financials, which was um, launched in 2018, and it was the first uh, investor coalition on, on living wages. And they are an alliance of 19 financial institutions um, with over 4.8 trillion euro of assets under management, um, mostly Dutch, but uh, also expanding into Europe and they encourage and monitor investee companies to address um, the non-payment of li living wages in global supply chains. And Platform Living Wage Financials actually takes us to um, this short case study that we have on Robico, um, which is an asset uh, management firm from the Netherlands, um, very much focused on, on sustainable finance. And they worked with um, Platform Living Wage Financials um, in their engagement which started in 2019 um, on the payment of living wages in the global supply chain of apparel um, of the apparel industry and they engaged with nine companies um, in the industry in this process ranging from fast fashion retailers to luxury brands and they focused on three things in their engagement they focused on um, how companies uphold the payment of living wages across their strategy on how this is supported by responsible purchasing practices and meaningful um, industry collaborations, and also whether they offered remedies when incidents um, related to wages were identified. 
So they ran this engagement program for three years and they reported um, seeing positive progress uh, and they successfully closed half, about half of their cases. Um, and in their active ownership reports at the end of last year, um, they also recognize a challenge in terms of corporate disclosure, which is something that we also encountered a lot. Um, sort of, we were told in our in our interviews that we conducted. So not only because, um, of course, there is limited disclosure at the moment on wages and especially living wages um, from corporations, but also for uh, brands that um, participate in, for example, multi-stakeholder initiatives promoting decent work, um, they actually don't often disclose sort of the outcomes um, of those engagement of those um, of their involvement in multi-stakeholder um, initiatives. So there's still some progress to be made, but clearly, as we can see um, from the involvement of the entire financial sector and from this example from Rubico, um, there is positive progress uh, in this space. I will now pass back to Anna. Thanks so much, Marina. Um, so just to um, just to finish up, um, we wanted to kind of uh, do two things. Um, the first one is to think about the wider context in which um, living wages should be paid. And the reason we're doing this is because, as, as Marina mentioned, we've, we've done um, 31 interviews um, to try and understand what businesses are doing, um, what investors are doing, and how we're moving um, towards living wages. And one thing that was repeatedly um, emphasized to us as we were asking is that living wages are much more meaningful when they're paid in a wider context of decent work. So um, living wages, um, they've, they've become a very, um, very appealing, um, very easy to understand idea that you pay people the right amount and what they need to live on. Um, and it's it's amazing that companies are moving in this direction um, and this is really gaining momentum. I think if we step back and we think about, well, what what would work look like with living wages but no other standards of decent work, um, we'd realize that it still would be very problematic. So instead we're saying, you know, living wages like are absolutely a kind of core pillar of what decent work means, but there's other parts of decent work as well, which um, absolutely have to be upheld, including issues like safe work, um, ensuring social protection, um, making sure that workers have legal rights, that they have voice and recognition in their roles at work, um, and that they have access to wider things such as education and training, infrastructure and services. So this is um, just, it's not to detract from the discussion of living wages at all, but to say that living wages are like fundamental to this, um, but don't stop there, please, <laughs> I think is the, is the overall message. Um, and then moving on to the challenges, um, there's some, some challenges which um, Marina's already alluded to, um, maybe next slide, um, this, Marina's already alluded to uh, with her discussion about Fairphone and they, how they've navigated some of the issues along the way. Um, so other things that have come up have been in terms of calculating and measuring living wages. This isn't rocket science, it's not really difficult. Um, it's just a case, that there's lots of different ways that you can measure it. So people who are embarking on that living wage journey need to work out, there's a, there's a bit of thinking that needs to happen before you can say we are paying living wages because some, some research has got to be done, some calculations to work out what the living wage rates would be in the, in the countries where, or the, or the cities where, where someone's working. I think um, what's also um, particularly interesting um, regarding this is that I think the people who are or the companies that are trailblazing now are possibly the ones who've got to do more thinking around this whereas as this becomes more and more normal and more and more established um, there will be um, better um, records regarding like, what the living wage is in certain locations and it will be much quicker to, to know what that living wage is and then to implement it. I think one thing we learned um, particularly from Fairphone was the importance of engaging with workers um, that we saw this challenge they faced in terms of you know how do you pay a living wage premium to only a handful of workers within a larger factory meeting lots of different orders from many different companies many of which aren't paying living wages um, and engaging workers in that case clearly was a very good way of um, making sure that what by trying to do a good thing you didn't accidentally do a bad thing by increasing competition or um, creating disputes within the factory context so that was a really, really nice kind of example of how that worked well. Um, 
gender is a really interesting one and a couple of our interviewees um, really highlighted to us that actually there's this implicit assumption that um, that living wages will be good for women or that it will be good at kind of narrowing that gender pay gap. Of course, like increasing someone's wage from being quite low to a bit higher is, is beneficial. The problem comes in when um, quite a lot of living wage calculations work on the assumption of a more or less full-time working week. And what we know about women's work is that women work much, much more than a full-time working week, but some of that work is unpaid care and domestic work in addition to paid work. And because they've got so many hours of work, sometimes their paid work gets squeezed to a shorter number of hours, which means that by the end of the work, their the working week or the paid working week, what they've earned doesn't always amount to what they need to live on um, that week. So it's just a flag to say, you know, when we when we do make these calculations, it's really important to make them gender sensitive um, and bring in that awareness and that knowledge that we have about the different work patterns that men and women have. Another thing that we just um, warn about is like quite often living wages are framed as a solution to poverty and inequality. And they absolutely are a very good way of addressing poverty, especially working poverty. They're a good way of starting to address inequality, but I wouldn't oversell them um, to say that they're enough to address um, inequality as a whole, because of course inequality is to do with the whole spectrum of earnings and wealth. It's not just to do with the people at the bottom end. So it's going to be important to kind of make sure we um, have other solutions to inequality alongside that. Um, and then there's, um, I think the last thing is just in terms of making sure that workers receive the money that they are due to be paid. Again, like a procedural thing, shouldn't be too difficult, but it's just making sure that it really happens. Um, perhaps we could go on to the last slide, Marina. Um, so Marina and I have produced a few um, outputs um, from this project. Um, we're really excited um, that uh, this report, The Case for Living Wages, is about to be launched in May 2022, um, and it's going to be launched um, in or around um, the, the rescheduled Davos um, meeting of the World Economic Forum. And so like, do look out on CSL social media channels because we'll be making some noise about it at the time. We're also preparing an academic paper, and if you're interested, um, we did run a, a webinar during um, Living Wage Week about investment um, and decent work and living wages. Um, with um, with CSL's um, sustainable finance group, so that may also be of interest to you. I think Beck is going to pop a link in the chat for that right now, in case you want to follow up. And then um, we also just wanted to point anyone who is interested in this, who wants some more information, um, to some useful resources that we've found. There's a huge wealth of different organisations working on this. Um, so if you're at all inspired, or if you've already started this journey and you want some support. Um, we'd really recommend in particular these three, but there's many others as well, who are already out there doing the hard work, trying to figure out how to make this work and also offering advice to people just getting started. Um, I think that just leaves me to say thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you've found it interesting and we really look forward to, um, to your questions. Thank you very much, Anna and Marina. Um, that was great, uh, covered a lot of ground. We do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, just to sort of ju just to sort of acknowledge that you did mention this and i think it's very very important that this is a global challenge this could relate to a company based in western europe with a supply chain into asia or some other part of the world it could equally apply to a company headquartered in uh in asia with with a supply chain back into the uk or back into another comparable country this is a this is a global issue and i think we have questions in the area of how does one determine living wage in these different political and cultural and economic contexts? Uh, you've mentioned organisations like the Global Global Living Wage Coalition, and of course in the UK we have the Living Wage Foundation. It does feel to me, uh, from what you're saying, that you know, given especially given the poll that we have multiple definitions, whether it's minimum or fair or living. And of course, major uh, major differences in different parts of the world. How <clears throat> how should companies begin to fathom what a living wage actually is, with some degree of confidence, before they embark on establishing levels and and hopefully doing something about their pay? 
It's a great question. Um, maybe I'll kick off and then um, Marina can follow up um, with, some, with some more details. I've only got time for brief answers, um, I'm afraid, Anna. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll be quick then. Um, so, so there's various different methodologies, and um, the anchor methodology is also is a really well respected methodology, um, where they really go into um, a country and do a lot of in-depth, detailed research. Another thing that is probably really worthwhile doing is engaging with unions, um, who are very interested in pay as well, and will have a lot to say on that topic. Um, and look, consults like if there's a national norm for the country you're living in, like like Jade mentioned the for the UK, the Living Wage Foundation, um, they've already done the hard work for you, so you can you can adopt that. So there's there's different approaches, um, but there's lots of methodologies out there, and sometimes it's already been calculated. And I honestly think like the more companies that are doing this, there'll be a critical mass of information and knowledge, and then there'll be it'll be much the more that it gets involved, the easier it's going to be. Um, so so it should ease up in the coming years, I'm sure. But it, it it's fair to say, isn't it? Because we have a question around whether governments and policymakers should be taking the initiative here versus more voluntary efforts by companies, which are uh, more along the lines that you've, you've given us in the case studies. That does seem to, it's not a tension so much, but it seems to be a kind of a bit of a missed opportunity. How, how do you see progress here? I mean, we, you know, we've waited a hundred years and we still don't have a, a sort of decent level of, of living wage commitments or practice globally is this really something that needs to be dealt with through regulation or do you see these voluntary efforts and the kind of growing consensus that that this is good for business as well as good for society being sufficient to drive action at the speed which we require marina do you want to take that on or should i um, I can start, Anna, and then you can add if you want a little bit. I think I just have one point. We often heard in our interviews um, from companies and other actors that regulation should play a pretty big part. Um, however, also when speaking, for example, to the ILO, what we heard is that, you know, governments do have a pretty difficult job in kind of trying to, um, in a way, balance the, the sort of asks of workers and also businesses. Um, and oftentimes they do ask for kind of opposite um, side. So often workers will, will ask for higher wages as well as businesses will try to keep their costs lower and so governments need to sort of balance that and that is why you know they often have minimum wages as opposed to living wages. Um, but then often the companies that are pioneers in the field and that want those higher wages in order to make sure that their workers have a decent standard of living they are asking as well for governments to take that into consideration and they are asking for support and so um i think that in the countries where you know for example such as in the uk where government does support to some extent um businesses to to make this change then that is where living wage will um advance most quickly and so um, in my opinion, yes, governments do have a role to play, um, but it is quite difficult for them and we have to sort of acknowledge that. I don't know if you have anything else, Anna. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I, I think I just, like, thank you, Maria. Um, I just add that um, the dream is that the living, the minimum wage gets raised up to living wage levels and then it's all, and then extended to people to to include all workers. Um, you know that would be a very a very good way of doing things. Maybe it's interesting just to note that actually the Nordic countries, quite a few of them, don't have minimum wages, and it's all all their wages are set through um, negotiation um, between employers and unions. So and you know for them there isn't a low wage problem particularly. Um, it's some of the most equal countries in the world. So it's not like minimum wages are the only route to this. Um, but the, I think the issue is just you know, how do we get there as quickly as possible? And at, at present, minimum wages aren't catching up with living wages quickly enough. And this is why there's such a kind of golden opportunity for businesses to really lay, lead the way, actually, um, and start taking some of those bold steps, which really need to happen. Because we can see that the cost of not paying living wages is so high in terms of the human cost, but also in the business cost as well. Um, we'd we'd um, do a great job of moving quickly towards many of the sustainable development goals if we could um, figure this out, because um, it's really holding so many people back. Thanks both. Um, that is exciting then to to acknowledge the you know the, the the really substantive opportunity for business to shape the uh, the low pay living wage debate, obviously in partnership with other stakeholders such as unions and government, but uh, your you're, you've definitely created a space there where you've said 
this would make a difference. And I think that obviously extends to the investors in those companies as well uh, and, and investment generally to make sure that, you know, capital is driving the change process as much as uh, individual business action. So thank you for that. Um, I think that the, the next question surrounds is sort of coming up in different forms, and that is where does where does the living wage discussion? How is it situated within the broader discussion about you know good jobs or decent work, as it's sometimes uh, referred to? So even within the pay space. You know, we have a we have a debate about living wage, but we also have one about executive pay. We also have one about uh, the stratification of pay, uh, the highest earners versus the lowest earners in a company, or the Gini coefficient, as it's sometimes uh, used used in measurement. So there's there's a there's a range of issues around pay, living wages among them. But then within the decent workspace, we also have things like you know working conditions, discrimination at work, contract types. Um, how important is this living wage discussion, do you think, in the, the overall social sustainability sphere? Is it is it one of those kind of leverage points that if we get this right, lots of other things come into focus? Or is it just one of a dozens of issues around this, all of which need to be tackled with the same kind of force? Interesting question. Um, I'd like to think it is a leverage point, actually, um, because like we... Um, there's a great sociologist called Goran Thurborn who talks about different types of inequality. Um, one is existential inequality, so life expectancy, which is such a um, striking measure of inequality because you see some people actually just don't even get to live as long as others. Um, and this is really geographically patterned as well. Um, another type is um, material inequality, so that's your um, financial and um, other resources. Um, so that's where wages fit in. And then the last one is um, in terms of respect. Um, so, and we see that they line up. So I think when you pay people better, um, often that comes with higher levels of respect as well. And when you've got higher levels of respect, maybe you're treated better in the workplace. So, you know, it's, it doesn't, one doesn't guarantee the other, but I would have a strong expectation that when you tr start treating people better, which starts with thinking, what does this person need to live on and am I exploiting them by um, not paying them enough? When you start when you, when you start changing your way of thinking and thinking about what workers need, um, and the living wage is a great place to start with that, hopefully that new way of conceptualizing your workers and relating to your workers hopefully has kind of leads to other effects. And you do see that um, some of the worst human rights abuses in the workplace um, often line up with very low pay. So, I, I would think it is a leverage point, um, but you know, it's we're quite early in that journey as well, so it, it remains to be seen what will happen. But given given what we've seen elsewhere, I, I think it is a pivotal point. Yes, we're sort of the dilemma is we're early in the journey, even though it's been a hundred years so far. Thinking about it, it's just incredible. Um, a, a last question, I think we've got we've got time for. And uh, this one concerns is is living wage a really an issue for larger companies that have the flexibility to think about um, all of the issues and, and the business cases behind why they might benefit from adopt, adopting living wages versus let's say a small even a micro sized company that may not feel that it that it has that sufficient financial muscle to invest in that way and you know how do we sort of begin to develop arguments which might suit both the large and the small or the the ones with the flexibility versus the ones who may be you know just establishing themselves and not feel that they, they they're quite there yet is this a big organization agenda only um, I don't think so I don't think so at all I think it's for everyone but Marina do you want to come in on this mm -hmm. I will just um, note that we did speak to a small company actually um, locally in Cambridge in our research as well. And I think they actually gave us the most straightforward answer in terms of um, whether there's a business case or not, or how they adopt it or their motivation. And they just said, we just knew we had to do it and we did it. And it was quite easy once we knew what the living wage rate was and we just paid everyone a living wage rate and that was it. Um, and that was because they don't have, you know, very complex uh, supply chains. They don't, um, they, the company that we spoke to, we uh, they don't have many um, other contractors or anything. They don't have many employees. And so 
um, they they had to make the finances work, but once they knew that they had to do that, and in order to become a, a living wage accredited employer, to them it was very straightforward and very easy, and then they just adjusted everything else um, based on that. So they actually provided us with the most um, simple and straightforward story, as opposed to larger companies who did um, kind of bring or explain a lot of a lot of challenges that they had due to their size. Um, so yeah, that's just one one little story from our research. One data point. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, I think I'd like to wrap up now, but before I do, just to acknowledge that we have several links relating to the topic area in the chat, which uh, could provide useful resources for those of you who've participated, um, and also to, um, uh, to to invite you again to uh, to take a look at uh, Marina and Anna's report when it's published. Uh, I think in May. Uh, at Davos, uh, which really is a great summary of, of some of the issues which we've been covering. Um, Marina just touched on Cambridge, uh, a Cambridge company here. I sometimes think that, um, you know, possibly Cambridge needs a waiting system as well as uh, major uh, uh, major cities like London, because actually the cost of living in here and in many parts of the world is just sort of, a, it's just becoming very much more complicated for people in the current context, and I wonder whether those figures which we saw during the poll might quite, you know, increase quite radically over the next few years as a, to accommodate uh, the inflation, energy price rises, and lots of instabilities and volatilities in the economy right right around the world. So clearly, this is a this is a this is a moving debate, which is sometimes why it's I think quite hard for companies to to plan ahead and understand quite what the implications are. Uh, but certainly. Um, Certainly, that was food for thought. So I'd like to thank you, Anna and Marina, for the presentation. Um, really glad you've been able to do that. I'd like to thank Unilever for the uh, for its generous support of the uh, of the fellowship program. And of course, thank you all for participating today. It's um it's great to have you as part of these uh, as part of this series. Great to have your questions. And uh, although we conclude uh, this round of four webinars based around our research program. We are very likely to do more in future, and I hope you can participate in some or all of those. And lastly, I'd like to thank two people who haven't been uh, thanked uh, sufficiently during the process, and that's um, that's Rebecca and Jana, who have been masterminding uh, the, uh, th this webinar series. They've done an enormous round of work uh, behind the scenes to get them into this shape. So thanks very much for all your efforts on that. And I'll say goodbye and thank you once again for your participation. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.